Thank you, Jeffrey. I am very pleased to give a brief introduction here at this wonderful conference on Jewish and Christian relations at Elon University. I was reminded uh, in attending Jeff Stein's son, Benny's bar mitzvah, uh, last month in Greensboro by Rabbi Fred Gutman that the history of Jewish Christian relations at Elon goes back a long way. And in fact, a Sunday morning some 80 years ago, uh, there was a story in the newspaper that one of our football players, Archie Israel, who played for the Fighting Christians, which was our old mascot here at Elon, was the star of the game uh, that previous day. And uh, I was intrigued by that story, so I had to go dip back in the archives and actually find a copy of it. And I wanted to show it to you today. Because it says that Israel leads Christians. <laughs> Archie and Adelaide were wonderful people. Adelaide was one of those great encouragers. Uh, I remember when, when Elon was in pursuit of a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, Adelaide had her key from women's college. And I went to visit her soon after Archie died, and she said, Leo, I just want you to keep going on that Phi Beta Kappa initiative. It's so important, and I'm going to be there in the front row wearing my key when Elon receives that distinction. She was a great, great person. I want to welcome you to the Newman Lumen Pavilion. This building has only been open since February, and this place was constructed to be a place of interfaith, dialogue, relations, and understanding. And we're proud of that mission here at Elon. It's a home for our Truett Center for Religious and Spiritual Life. It's a home for the Center for the Study of Religion, Culture, and Society. When Edna and Doug Noyles endowed the Center for Religious and Spiritual Life at Elon, they had a simple and powerful idea behind it. And that was that while Elon students were here in these formative, important university years, she wanted them to have an opportunity, Edna in particular, to explore their faith and other faiths, and then to go into the world and live lives of reconciliation. A beautiful idea. And that's what we're trying to follow here. Our work in religious and spiritual life at Elon, I think, is, is pretty simple in, in concept. First, we're hoping that every student that comes to Elon will find a spiritual home here. We're proud of the fact that our Jewish student population is growing rapidly. It's about 10% of our student body right now. And last spring, we also dedicated the Sklut Hillel Center here on campus. And we've recently opened and uh, dedicated the former president's residence uh, for use as the Catholic Newman Center. We have uh, Lutherans, Episcopalians, and Friends ministries, and many other ministries. We want students to find a home. We want them to find uh, a spiritual family here. But more important than that, in addition to that, we, we really do believe it should be a hallmark of an Elon education to engage in interfaith dialogue, to advance understanding, and to promote peace. I'm proud to have as my friend Ibu Patel, who is the executive director of the Interfaith Youth Corps. Many of you know his work. He's visited Elon uh, a couple of times. And Ibu has, I think, the right idea, which is to see the other side, to defend another people, not despite your tradition, but because of it, is the heart of pluralism. A powerful thought. Let me commend the organizers of today's program. Uh, two of my uh, wonderful colleagues, Jeffrey Pugh, Maud Sharp Paul, professor at Elon, one of Elon's longstanding and greatest faculty members, a wise, wise head and soul on this campus, and representing a legion of young faculty who have come to Elon and set this place on fire. There are many of them here in the room. Uh, and brought such uh, intellectual dynamism to the university is Jeffrey Clausen, who is the Sklut Emerging 
scholar in, uh, in Jewish studies at the university. What wonderful colleagues we have to advance special days like this for us all to enjoy. Let me turn the program back over to Jeffrey and Jeffrey. Thank you and welcome to Elon. So thank you, Dr. Lambert. Thank you for all the inspirational leadership that you provide for Elon University. Thank you especially for your commitment to diversity and to this space, the Newman Lumen Pavilion, and to all that this space represents here. You've done so much to promote the importance of interreligious dialogue and understanding, and it's thanks to your leadership that Elon is a natural host for the kinds of conversations that we'll be entering into over the course of this afternoon. Those conversations will be taking place in this room in person. They can also take place virtually. And if you are tweeting this conference, please see that. Please use that hashtag right there. I'm pleased to have organized this conference along with my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Pugh. The, the idea for this conference began as Dr. Pugh and I began to develop a new course that we've been teaching this semester, team teaching, focused on Jewish Christian relations in general and Jewish Christian dialogue in particular. We were able to bring together an outstanding group of expert scholars thanks to the support of many partners here at Elon. Above all, this event was made possible thanks to a grant from the Elon College Fund for Excellence. And we're grateful to the Dean of Elon College, Dean Allison morrison Shetler, and to the entire leadership of our College of Arts and Sciences. This event is also made possible thanks to the generosity of Elon parents, Lori and Eric Scott who have established the Laurie and Eric Scott Emerging Scholar in Jewish Studies program at Elon. We are grateful to the Scott family for their commitment to Jewish studies and also for their particular interest in supporting programs that help to develop interreligious understanding. We're also grateful to the many other sponsors of today's program, which are listed on your paper program that you have, the Department of Religious Studies, the Department of History and Geography, the Women's and Gender Studies program, the Truett Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, and the Elon Center for the Study of Religion, Culture, and Society, which is Elon's new academic center housed within this pavilion. This conference explores various aspects of the past, present, and future of Jewish-Christian relations. And we will begin this afternoon with three presentations that will bring us through various periods of Jewish history and Christian history, and we'll conclude with reflections on the future of that relationship. We'll hear all three presentations in succession, and then we'll have some time at the conclusion of this first session, um, the, the first three papers here, for questions and responses to all three papers together. Our first presenter will be Dr. Mark Bregman, speaking on Jewish and Christian perspectives on the sacrifice of Isaac. Dr. Bregman is the Bernard Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies at UNC Greensboro. He received his PhD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, before coming to North Carolina, he taught for many years at the Jerusalem campus of Hebrew Union College, and he is the author of an outstanding volume on the Tanhuma Yilamdenu literature. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Bregman. Um, I set up the talk. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, to all of you who organized this, um, it has given me a chance to talk in a public forum about something that I teach about a little bit, but I've never really had a chance to sort of lay out, so I'm really interested in your responses. I set the talk up that in the way that I teach where there would be sort of questions you'll see in the PowerPoint, but I think I'll just leave those as sort of like rhetorical questions for the moment and anybody who wants to respond in the question and answer period at the end of the three talks, then we'll, we'll leave it for that just to make sure we stay within the time frame. Um, um, let's see if we, is this supposed to be on my paper? Yes. What do I, do I press something here to get it to mine? Oh, good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, this is a little snippet of the course that I teach, my favorite course that I teach at UNCG, and I've taught other places on uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, and this is really what I taught this year. This is what we, we had. It was an online course in October, uh, this week of October 21st. I was talking about Jewish Christian context. And we're just going to do a little bit of the part where that big arrow is, who carries the wood on his shoulders. Um, I don't think I'll read the whole story of the sacrifice of Isaac. I assume that most of you are kind of familiar with it. We're really going to focus on one half of a verse 
where you may, you may recall that when Abraham and Isaac and the two servant boys or whatever and the donkey are on the way to Mount Moriah, uh, Abraham places the wood for the burnt offering on his son Isaac. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, it's been depicted in, in uh, a Christian art and I don't know about Jewish art, but this is the earliest one that I know of, really very early for Christian art, third century in a Christian catacomb in Rome. You can see Isaac there. It's the, the bottom part has been uh, destroyed. Um, and just to jump up something, you know, um, uh, Gustave Doré uh, illustrated the whole of the Bible and his depiction of Isaac carrying the wood. Um, it, uh, so the question is, who carries the wood on his shoulders? And you might think, well, there's no question. I mean, it says quite plainly in the Bible that it was Isaac. But it's interesting that it does come up as a question. And for that, you have to know something about what's called typological interpretation, which I'm sure some of you are quite aware of. But very quickly, we're talking about this. Typological, typology in Christian theology and biblical exegesis is a doctrine or theory concerning the predictive relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. So without this, it would be hard to understand why the the Christians retained the Old Testament. Well, I read the Old Testament if it's the old dispensation. So it, it always is, it's almost in terms of this way of interpreting, it's always in something to relationship to the New Testament. Um, in, uh, events, persons, or statements in the Old Testament are seen as types prefiguring or superseded by antitypes, events, or aspects of Christ and his revelation described in the New Testament. If we had time, you could click on this and get to the Wikipedia entry, which is quite good on uh, typology. Okay, so here's the question, which we'll just leave as a rhetorical question for the moment. Using Christian typological interpretation, Isaac carrying the wood for his sacrifice on his own shoulders might be a prefiguration of what event in the life of Jesus described in the New Testament. I see shaking of heads yes, so I think you all got it already. Uh, probably Jesus carrying his cross. Uh, and here's a, a picture I got off the internet. I mean. Uh, not maybe the most famous artist in the world, but I think a very poignant portrayal. And it's mentioned in uh, all of the, um, the Gospels. Uh, the one in John is quite unique, but I think the best one to illustrate my point. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Arabic is called Golgotha, where they crucified him. OK, so this. Now, the typological interpretation of this already begins very early, some of the very earliest um, interpretations that we have from the patristic period, in other words, the immediate, immediately after the New Testament period. This is attributed to Miletus of Sardis. Uh, Melito of Sardis, probably not really Melito of Sardis, but that doesn't really uh, affect us. Second century, uh, this is from some sort of a sermon or something, uh, but the key thing is what I put on the side there. Jesus carried the wood on his shoulders as he was led up to be slain like Isaac by his father. So connecting the New Testament with the Old Testament story of sacrifice of Isaac. Um, again, very quickly, just some of the patristic to church fathers. Uh, Augustine uh, in uh, the uh, fifth century, of course, a very, very important church father. Isaac also himself carried to the place of sacrifice the wood on which he was to be offered up, just as the Lord himself carried his own cross. Very typical typological interpretation. And finally, just so that we get some Protestant uh, uh, material in as well, and we're jumping way to the 18th century, it continues all through all these centuries, Isaac's carrying the wood was a type of Christ who carried his own cross. So none of that is surprising. Very typical uh, and I think powerful Christian interpretation. Um, and you even have it in art here. I, I like this one uh, because uh, I think the way that the artist has depicted the wood on Isaac's shoulders looks like a cross, okay? I mean, it seems to say cross almost. Okay, so all of this is not so surprising, but this is surprising. Now we have a passage from rabbinic, rabbinic literature in a work called Genesis Rabbah, which is our earliest Midrashic work on um, the book of Genesis. Now, Midrash, I like to define as creative interpretation of scripture. It is meant to be creative. It is not meant to be the simple, straightforward, unadulterated uh, uh, meaning of the text. And on the verse, so this is, and now this work contains material that up and 
it seems to have been edited so it contains material up until around the 4th, 5th century CE in Palestine. So we're, whoever put this in this work was living in the context of Roman Byzantine culture in Palestine. That's very important. Um, Byzantine being the Christian period of uh, Roman rule in Palestine after Christianity became the dominant religion in the Roman world. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, as one condemned for execution who is made to carry the cross on his shoulders. I read this, my hair stands on end. How in the world could a Jewish rabbi, a preacher, want to make the connection that the Christians had made so much of between Isaac and Jesus? Why? I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that anybody could have taught this or included this in any work uh, that it was, he was putting out without some, knowing that there was some echo of Christianity here. Okay, so now how are we going to explain this? It's interesting that we have a passage which is a parallel in the Tanhuma literature, which is what, as uh, Professor Klausen men mentioned, that was sort of the main part of my research. Um, and here, just notice the difference. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. To whom might Isaac be compared? This is a real parallel, right? To one whom, after being condemned to death, was going out to be burned with his wood on his shoulders. So now, if you think about which came first, and also which is closer to the biblical text, which is less creative, I would normally have that as a discussion question, but I think you'd have to say the Tanhuma text is closer because, in fact, Isaac is carrying his wood to be burned, right? We know that Abraham built an altar and he was going to sacrifice him with a knife and then burn him. So it's really quite close to the, the, what we call the pshat, the simple meaning of the text. And, but on the other hand, it's almost universally agreed that the Tanhuma literature is later than Genesis Rabbah, right? So normally we would think that, Genesis, that Tanhuma is adapting, rewriting, reworking a passage in Genesis Rabbah. So another possibility is, is that the, whoever put together Tanhuma Buber, by the way, Buber, only not, that's not Martin Buber, that is the grandson of Martin Buber, Shlomo Buber, who, Solomon Buber, who, the grandson, right, I think? Right, Shlomo Buber, of course. Shlomo Buber is the grandfather of Martin Buber, and Martin Buber kind of spent a lot of time in the summers with his granddad and got a lot of his Yiddishkeit, his Jewishness from his father. Martin, Sh Shlomo Buber, who edited the text, that's why it's, why it's called Tanhuma Buber, was a, a very well-to-do Jewish businessman and head of this kind of the, um, the local um, business association, and he edit, his hobby was editing midrashim. He edited 16 midrashim in his spare time, um, and he had access to a lot of manuscripts. He published some manuscripts. Because he was a well-to-do person, he could, and well-known, he could have Cambridge send him a manuscript by stagecoach or however. It was way before photography. This is, it came out in 1885. Okay. Um, it looks to me, to make a long story short, as if Brashit Rabbah said, uh uh, no, we're not, uh uh, I'm not, I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole. And adapted it quite interestingly to be more like the, um, the, uh, the biblical story. That seems to me what happened. And somebody already very quickly said, um, mm, no way, I'm not putting that in my book. Okay? So now, that's where I'm going to leave this for a moment. And I'm going to take a big, big jump. Okay, we're going to make it. We're going to make a big jig jump to a work of art. Anybody know who? Does that ring a bell? Chagall, right away. Okay. Now look at the way Mark, Mark Chagall depicts the, uh, the Akedah, the Binding of Isaac story. You look up in the upper corner, a, somebody carrying a crucifix, probably Jesus, right? Um, and a little closer up, and now if you look at the figure that's right, so Marc Chagall, for those of you who don't know, was a Russian Jewish French artist, mostly spent most of his time working in Paris, but very much depicted the life of the shtetl, the Jewish community in the, in the farther to the east. Um, and he has been referred to as the quintessential Jewish artist of the 20th century. So what's the quintessential artist of the 20th century doing putting crucifixes and Jesus into his art? Um, 
And, but what's interesting that who is this figure behind, walking behind Jesus? How is this figure walking behind Jesus dressed? What might the way this figure is depicted suggest about how the Jewish artist Mark Chagall viewed the crucifixion of Christ? Were there time enough? I would let you chew that over a bit. But a little help here. Um, just to give you another way that shtetl Jews of the similar period have been depicted, typical hat. I think it's pretty clear that Mark Chagall was trying to say here is, who is following Jesus, a typical Jew from the shtetl like I grew up in. Clear? Okay. So it's interesting that Mark Chagall just seemed to be almost obsessed with this in a way. Uh, he did a couple of pastels after he did the, the oil painting, and in every painting, every depiction, he always used the same basic format. And uh, we have, you know, again, the Jesus or something in the upper corner. Um, this is perhaps one of the most famous paintings by Chagall that I, helps, I think helps us understand what's going on here. It's he titled The White Crucifixion. Um, so what do you see in the painting? Clearly. Jesus um, uh, crucified, but I think very unique. What's his loincloth looks like a talus, a talit, a Jewish prayer shawl. Uh, on his head, he doesn't have a crown of thorns. He has something like a, a, uh, some kind of rag, I don't know, something of that sort. And if you look all around the, the edges, uh, you have images of Jews fleeing here and there and whatnot. So what is he trying to say here? Um, uh, let's read very quickly. I think we have time. We have another two minutes. Okay, so we're going to read this in one minute, and I'm going to pose my question. In 1938, the 1938 painting by Mark White Crucifixion represents a critical turning point for the artist Mark Chagall. It was the first of an important series of compositions featuring the image of Christ as a Jewish martyr and dramatically call attention to the persecution and suffering of Jewish, Jew, European Jews in the 1930s. Jewish identity of Jesus, well, we can go on and on, but let's get to the bottom. By linking the martyred Jesus with the persecuted Jews and the crucifixion with contemporary events, Chagall's painting passionately identifies the Nazis with Christ's tormentors and warns of the moral implications of their, of their, of their actions. So he understood the martyred Jesus as a symbol of the martyrdom or the suffering of the Jewish people. I think that's, we could summarize it. Okay, so now we get to, and interestingly enough, Pope Francis, the new Pope, says this was his favorite painting of all, of any painting he knows, this is his favorite painting. So I was, I was gonna ask you the question, like, do you like it or don't like it? But at least one Christian, quite important Christian, <laughs> likes this painting a lot. Okay, um, eh, so would this make a good illustration of the Genesis Rabbit text? I personally think it's kind of, it would make an interesting illustration. I don't know that I would put it in a book directed at Jews, because I think it would cause a lot of questions that I would want to be able to discuss. And um, here's my final question, and with that I'm going to end. Does Chagall's painting help us understand why, in the Byzantine period, when Jews were under Roman Christian rule, a Jewish commentator on the Akedah, the Binding of Isaac story, compared Isaac's carrying the wood on his shoulders to someone made to carry his cross to his execution. Uh, since it's going to be quite a while before we get to any discussion, uh, here's what I think is going on. And I only really came up with this because of your very kind, kind uh, uh, invitation. One sentence. I think possibly it wouldn't be so far-fetched to think that the reason why somebody put this text into the Genesis Rabbah collection was in a way to say what Mark Chagall was saying. He was saying, we know about Jesus, and for us, Jesus is our suffering. He's Jewish. He suffered on the cross, and we suffer. And it, it, it's not so far from, it's not such a different. It's not you and us. It's, it, it, it's us together. It's some kind of a statement of that sort. And it's the first time I ever came up with that interpretation. So I thank you very much for inviting me to give that talk. And I look forward to your Thank you, Dr. Bregman. We'll be staying with the book of, we'll have an opportunity to come back for questions and discussion on this presentation. And we'll be staying now with the book of Genesis, uh, but moving elsewhere within the book as we hear from Dr. Ellen Haskell, Associate Professor of Religious Studies also at UNC Greensboro. 
Dr. Haskell received her PhD from the University of Chicago. She is a scholar of Jewish mystical literature, interested in history and culture. She's the author of a book, uh, which you can purchase out here, titled Suckling at My Mother's Breasts, The Image of a Nursing God in Jewish Mysticism. She'll be speaking this afternoon on contesting the kingdom of heaven, Rachel as a counterpart to Christ in medieval Jewish mysticism. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ellen Haskell. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so this fits very nicely after Mark's talk because I'm also talking about Jews reading someone as a Christ figure, um, in this case, the matriarch Rachel. So as Jewish mystics known as Kabbalists developed their theology in the 12th and 13th centuries, they faced a very challenging environment, still a more fraught period in history. With the growth of the mendicant friars and the 1215 Fourth Lateran Council's attempts to police Christian society's boundaries, Jews living among Christians came to serve as conveniently located others by which the Christian community defined itself. In southern France and northern Spain, where Kabbalah first appeared, public religious disputations, forced Jewish attendance at Christian sermons, and trials and censorship of Jewish text became new means by which the church consolidated its own identity as a community of the faithful. New missionizing strategies emerged, like the use of rabbinic literature to prove Christian truth claims. Um, and during the 13th century, Spain's Jewish community became familiar with these claims with public and private debates, polemic literature, and art that went going up on churches everywhere at the time. Um, indeed, the Spanish Kabbalists possessed intimate knowledge of Christian ideas and of the specific gospel texts. Today, I want to demonstrate how the mystics resisted Christian majorities' religious truth claims by creating literature that used Christian themes to assert Jewish truths. Um, so Sefer HaZohar, the Book of Splendor, which is the most important work of classical Jewish Kabbalah, was composed in northern Spain in the late 13th century. And in it, the matriarch Rachel, who suffers a very painful death in childbirth in Genesis 35, receives a very unusual treatment. Um, Rachel's death while bearing Benjamin, the final Israelite tribal ancestor, is described as a necessary precedent for God's divine presence, which in Jewish mysticism is often gendered female and called Shekhinah, which is divine presence, um, to manifest among the 12 tribes of Israel. And this interpretation of Rachel's death breaks with earlier rabbinic tradition, in which when Rachel dies, it's understood to be caused by her husband Jacob's death curse of the idol thief, right? She's run away and taken her father's idols. He doesn't know Jacob curses. And it's not connected in the Bible, but she dies. Rachel's significance in this literature is tied to her role as essence of the house, um, ikar habayit, which is a term that derives from a rabbinic wordplay on Psalms 113, um, akeret habayit, which is a barren woman in her house. Just as the Psalms barren woman is transformed into a happy mother of children, God transforms the barren Rachel of Genesis 29 into the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. And the rabbis understand Rachel's role as essence of the house to mean the Israelite people are called by her name and by the name of her descendants. In the Zohar, however, Rachel's death provides the focal point for asserting Jewish identity in a way that negates contemporary Christian claims about Jews. And this assertion invokes elements of the Christ narrative and hinges on a reinterpretation of the term kingdom of heaven. So to understand the following te texts, it helps to know that of the many names for God's divine presence in Kabbalah, these include um, Shekhinah, presence, lower world, essence of the house, Mahut, which means kingdom, and Mahut Adirikia, which means the kingdom of heaven. So here's the Zohar, this 13th century text about Rachel. For all those 12 tribes are themselves the adornment to the lower world. And when Benjamin was born, Rachel died, and this lower world took her place. For when Benjamin was born, Shekhinah joined herself with all those tribes and took the house with all of them. And Jacob knew in the secret of wisdom that when 12 tribes were completed, Shekhinah would adorn herself and join with them, and Rachel would die, and she would take the house. And then Rachel was purified, 
and Shekhinah took the house with all those tribes and became the essence of the house. And Jacob said, behold, the time has arrived for 12 tribes to be completed. And truly the world that is above will descend to the house to join with them, and this poor woman will be superseded before it. And again, uh, also on the same topic, same text. Why did Rachel die immediately after Benjamin's birth? So Shechina could be crowned as was fitting, and she could become the happy mother of children. And with him, she began to be established among 12 tribes. And with him, the kingdom of heaven began to manifest on earth. And this is the secret. For every beginning that comes to be made manifest is difficult, and therefore there is in it a judgment of death. And from there, it is settled. Come and see. Every beginning is severe, and afterwards, gentleness. And in the time to come, the Holy One, blessed be he, will prepare to arouse in gentleness against the rest of the peoples who worship the stars and planets. And afterwards, he will overpower them with harsh judgment. Now, in these teachings, Rachel's death and her son's birth stimulate the divine presence to manifest among the 12 tribes of Israel. Rachel's husband, Jacob, has prior knowledge of this event and its consequences, but the text implies her death is for the greater good, which is God's permanent indwelling among Israelites. Shekhinah's divinity supersedes Rachel's humanity. The divine presence assumes Rachel's role as essence of the house, the spiritual core of the Israelites. And this event is described as the kingdom of heaven emerging into the earthly world among its recipients, the Israelites. Now, this narrative actually addresses key polemic claims of the surrounding Christian community. So this is what Jews were hearing when they were forced to attend Christian sermons. Right, the three main arguments were, first, that the Messiah, human incarnation of God, had arrived in the person of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for humanity's salvations. Second, that the Messiah's coming invalidated Jewish law and practice, which was no longer necessary because the Messiah had already come. And third was the assertion that since Jews denied all this, they had, were rejected and had been excluded from present or future salvation. This is what they're hearing. Many of these ideas are sourced in the New Testament's teachings on the kingdom of heaven. Right? In Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven signifies an exclusively Christian salvific future where the 12 apostles sit enthroned in judgment over the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Jesus said to them in the new world, when the son of man shall sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, that's Matthew 19. This claim repeats in Luke 22. And in Matthew 23, you see that Pharisees, which is sort of a code for Jews, right, are barred from this future. So by developing a Rachel narrative in which the kingdom of heaven represents not an exclusive Christian salvation, but instead a divine manifestation that confirms that God is with the Jewish ancestors, the Kabbalists reclaim the kingdom of heaven from the 12 apostles and they return it to the 12 tribes of Israel. And returning the divine presence to the tribes in the past implies God is still connected with Jews in the present and in the future as well. A connection the Zohar makes in the second text I read in which God's future judgment on star worshipers serves as a code for God's judgment on Christians. Medieval Jews thought Christians were idolaters. Um, they're looking at churches with all kinds of art on the front. It makes them very uncomfortable. Um, elsewhere, the Zohar makes this connection more clear by drawing on rabbinic connections between Esau, Edom, Rome, and Christianity. Um, and it's worth thinking about the fact that these people are living among Roman ruins and Christian churches, which often resemble each other. So that connection between Rome and Christians is really present in their heads in a way that it's not um, for modern people. In the following passages, the Zohar returns the kingdom of heaven to Jews for eternity and identifies the kingdom of idolatry, which is code for Christendom, as an oppressive ruler whose domain is in the present but will not be in the future. And these texts use the kingdom of heaven to represent God's ideal relationship with Jews in a previous era and a time to come. So again, this is Zohar. Come and see. This is how Zohar talks, not me. And these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom. As it is written, Esau, that is Edom. That's Genesis. For the time had not yet arrived for the kingdom of heaven to rule and to unite with the children of Israel. And when it was settled, it settled on the smallest of all the tribes, which was Benjamin. 
Afterwards, the kingdom came to its place and was established with itself never to be removed. And you shall be blessed because I am holy. It's Leviticus 11. Who is I? The holy kingdom of heaven. The other kingdom of idolatry is called other. Come and see, I, rulership of the world and the world that is coming, upon which all depends. Other side, defilement, other. And his rulership is in this world, but he has nothing at all in the world that is coming. These Zoharic texts provide a counter argument to Christian claims about Jewish exclusion from salvation by placing Israel in a position of holiness and literally othering Christianity. Um, framing this argument in terms of kingdom of heaven, however, also lets the Kabbalists make a claim about Jewish law. The rabbis associate the term kingdom of heaven with the Shema prayer in Mishnah Brachot too, and explain that accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven is a necessary precedent for accepting the yoke of the commandments, which means Jewish law. And this theme is also expanded in Babylonian Talmud. So very, very ancient rabbinic texts all say that the kingdom of heaven is really the Shema prayer. Um, and clarify that the part of the Shema that's most relevant is the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, which is the core of Shema. Shema, of course, is the central Jewish declaration of faith and a distinct marker of Jewish identity. And as early as the year 200, reciting it was considered an act of acknowledging God's authority and his connection to Israel, which was called accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. This declaration of Jewish status prepared the person reciting it to practice Jewish law, to accept the yoke of the commandments. And drawing on these traditions, the Kabbalists used the kingdom of heaven to stress Jewish relationship with God and their hope for future salvation, and to affirm Jewish law's ongoing practice. So the Zohar's authors make this point even clearer when they write, at the hour that a person comes to receive upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, the Shekhinah comes and rests upon his head like a witness. The text implies that every contemporary Jew reciting the Shema reenacts Shekhinah's original coming among the 12 tribes of Israel in the past, engaging her in the present, and anticipating her in the future when she comes and rests on more Jews. Um, by applying these Jewish definitions and Kabbalistic redefinitions to a term that is held in common by Jews and Christians, or kingdom of heaven, the Zohar's authors extract the kingdom of heaven from Christian usage and make it a marker of Jewish faith and identity. Um, and to show how this deals with messianic claims, I'll return to Rachel herself, because her presence is essential to the Kabbalist idea of Judaism's validity. She allows them to rework the Christian foundational story of a human being whose death precedes divine manifestation into a Jewish context, transforming it into a critique of Christian principles. So although the Genesis describes Rachel's painful, difficult death, it's not the main focus of Jews on Rachel. It's as though the Kabbalists have looked for someone who could mirror Christ and chosen that story deliberately. Um, the Kabbalists' interpretation of Rachel's story connects them in different ways. They both suffer greatly before they die. Their suffering is both preordained. Jesus is known to himself, Rachel's to her husband. Both are among 12 figures, the apostles or the tribal ancestors. Both die for a greater purpose. Jesus dies for his followers' salvation. Rachel makes way for God's presence among the Israelites. Both hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus more literally, Rachel more figuratively. Both figures' death precedes divine manifestation with Jesus revealing his divine nature and Rachel making way for God's presence among the Israelites. So juxtaposing the Rachel narrative with the Christ narrative allows the Kabbalists also to show the difference between these stories. Um, and this helps them to kind of critique the Christians who are in turn critiquing them. Um, a few items. Rachel's death in the act of giving life contrasts her fertility to Jesus' celibacy, which is a state the authors thought of the Zohar thought was very troubling. Rachel as a dying human woman who's superseded by a divine manifestation acts as a foil to Jesus' ambiguous mingling of humanity and divinity, which also troubled Jews. And in fact, incarnational arguments were very important in this context. Jews heard them a lot. Um, the text implies that while human suffering and death might perceive the greater good of divine manifestation, that line between what is human, what's divine, can't be crossed. 
um, dying for the greater good doesn't divinize the one who suffers. Right? Shechina um, may take Rachel's place, but that poor woman, as her husband calls her, is still dead. Um, yet her death invokes the divine presence's arrival like Jesus as precedes the Holy Spirit in John 20. And just as Jesus purifies and removes the sins of those who believe in him in Christian doctrine, Rachel's death is also a purification. Um, finally, Rachel herself has messianic implications that belie Christian claims about Jesus as Christ. Um, for example, she herself has a role in announcing the coming of the Messiah, but that makes it clear that she's not the Messiah herself. Right, so there's all this, and what is it? It's not polemic, which is clear about its purpose. It's not parody, which is funny. It's really a persecuted minority trying to disassemble the claims of the group that is oppressing it in a very, very troubling time in order to reassert themselves and evoke some kind of place from which they cannot be moved. Our final presentation for this session, Moving Elsewhere in the Book of Genesis, comes from Dr. Malachi Cohen, the Fred W. Schaefer Associate Professor of History, Political Science, and Religion at Duke University, where he also directs the Center for European Studies. Dr. Cohen received his PhD from Columbia University and is the author of a book, also available in the atrium, on Karl Popper's formative years. He is presently completing a book in Jewish European history, focusing on the biblical story of Jacob and Esau, as it has been told through the ages. He'll be speaking this morning on Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Ishmael, the future of Jewish and Christian and Muslim relations. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, unlike the previous presenters, uh, I'm going to speak not about Jews imagining themselves as Jesus, but rather about Jews imagining Christians as Esau. Will we be able to have the presentation there? And then um, it's precisely the collapse of this, uh, of the typology, which makes possible uh, sessions such as today, that is the Christian Jewish uh, dialogue. And we are at the mercy of technology but it has been merciful. And this is the uh, beginning picture, which comes from the Torah portion of the week. Anyone identify what is this about? The reconciliation of Jacob and Esau. A picture that is all too absent from uh, the, norm, the history of the typology of Jacob and Esau. The biblical story of Jacob and Esau, I gather, is familiar to everyone. The There we go, okay. The oracle to Rebecca, predicting the coming of the two children, of the twins. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples shall diverge from your body. One people shall be mightier than the other, and the elder shall serve the youngers. And the twins struggled with each other from day one. Jacob bought the birthright or, uh, for uh, the a lentil soup, and then stole the blessings from Esau. Esau conspired to kill him. Jacob escapes abroad. And when he returns 20 years later with his family, the two brothers meet and reconcile. Redactors of the uh, uh, biblical text made uh, Esau the father of the Edomites, Israel's neighbor south of Judah. And uh, the Torah is ambivalent about Edom initially. The Edomites are considered neighbors, close to the Judeans, um, and yet the Torah is suspicious of their character. But following the destruction of the first temple of Jerusalem, the Bible turns hostile to the Edomites. What did the, what did the Edomites do? How did they participate in the destruction of Jerusalem? I do not know. You can see that 
Psalm 147, remember, O oh Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who say, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. They were blamed for the downfall of Jerusalem. And Edom became the arch enemy, a typological enemy, more so than Babylonia, so that the collapse of Edom and Sabre shall come up on Mount Zion to judge, to judge Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's, became a prerequisite for the salvation of Israel. Interestingly enough, all this is happening while you're in the second temple, the Edomians are the neighbors, the southern neighbors of the Judeans. Judah Maccabees, uh, country is coming, conquers the city Marasha, Later, the Hasmonean kings conquer all of Edomia, forcibly convert the Edomians, who become Jewish, and that's the end of the story. Right? Wrong. This is just the beginning. Because who comes next? The Romans. Who destroys the second temple? The Romans. But Rome is so far from Edom, isn't it? Rome and Edom, it doesn't matter. No matter. During the rebellion against the Romans of Bar Kokhba, 132 to 135, some Jewish rabbis began associating Edom and Issa with Rome. Alan a star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And Edom shall be dispossessed, and Satan's enemies shall also be dispossessed, and Israel will do parliament. He explained, this is the King Messiah. And in Jewish Midrashim homilies from that period, we begin seeing the identification of the Roman Empire with Israel. The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are Esau's hands. Jacob's voice cries out about what Esau's hands did to him in Beta, which was the last fortress city to fall to the Romans. And the hands of Esau's hands, Esau's hands, this refers to the evil empire, Malchut Arisha, that destroyed our temple and burned down our sanctuary and exiled us from our land. And the Jews, the nation, were right now confronting the evil brothers, the Roman Empire. Well, Esau, and Esau then begin, becomes the arch pagan, and the rabbis see Esau as having all the bad characteristics that they have, that they attribute to the Romans. Esau become a pagan Roman. But while this is happening in Berlin, Judaism, what other story is occurring? The emergence of Christianity. And after the Roman Empire itself becomes Christian, then in the fourth century, through the process of Christianizations, say the Christian read what was said to Rebecca. The elder shall serve the younger. Bear in mind that the emperors are worshippers of Christ and that you are cast from your kingdom. You pay tribute to me. You are Esau. The Christians are Jacob to Israel. And Augustine of Hippo, in his treatise against the Jews, which set the tolerant attitude of Christianity toward Judaism for the next millennium, says the Jewish people who were born first will serve the Christian people who were born afterwards. When Europe emerges as Christendom in the Middle Ages, Esau turns from being pagan into being Christian. And all the Jewish interpreters of the Middle Ages, even those who are victorious, accept this identification. Tashban, the first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called him his name Isam, like a hairy cloak, Adatsa, born by pilgrims, Shloshim Hatoim, literally those who lost their way. And this is rather popular attribution. A Thompson from Würzburg for two Jews killed in a brawl with Christians. Esau's descendants rose upon them and killed them. And finally, the quotation from the famous interpreter Rashi, the Holy um, um, 
The Holy One, blessed be He, swore that His name shall not be perfect and His throne shall not be perfect until Esau's name is universe. In other Rashi versions, it's not Esau's name until Amalek's name. And the difference between the two versions of Rashi is significant. This is the polar case. The relationship between Jews and Christians, between Esau and Jacob, is not like the relationship between Amalek and Israel, which is an eliminationist, destructive relationship. If Jacob, if Esau really killed Jacob, the story would be over. That's not a Jewish Christian relationship, which is why it's at the end only that Holocaust that is going to put an end to the typology of Jacob and Esau. Esau can murder, but for the most part, Esau oppresses. This is the typical relationship, Jewish-Christian relationship, that we have seen for almost two millennia. So, where are we? We started with the difficult story. We saw Esau becoming the father of Edom. We saw Edom emerging as a typological enemy. We saw the rabbis turning Edom into Rome, and the church father interpreting the elder shall serve the younger as Jew, uh, the Jews shall serve as, <clears throat> shall serve uh, the Christians. We also know that they, the Jews serve as testimony for the truth of Christianity. Whom did we miss in this story? We miss the Muslims. This is what the Muslims Mediterranean looks like around the time of Charlemagne and here in Spain the confrontation between Christianity and Islam. I think that's the thing that actually Christianizes Esau for the Jews. That is, the the Jew Esau continued to be pagan for Jews well after the empire was already, um, was already Christian. What about Isaac and Ishmael? The story is probably familiar to you. To you, Ishmael is born out of servant of Abraham. He is expelled by Sarah um, and is saved in the desert by God, who promises Ishmael that he too, who promises Adar that Ishmael too will be blessed and will be the father of a big, a great people. Very early on, before the rabbis, the Arabs. And the Muslims began to be identified with Ishmael. And the initial attitude of the rabbis were the, uh, toward, um, the, toward Ishmael ambivalent. While there are negative attributes ascribed to him, at the same time, look at that. God bless Abraham with everything, and Abraham the whole. He teaches us that Ishmael repented in the same way when Abraham was still alive. There are Jewish rabbis have a famous Salafic school called Rabbi Rabbi Ishmael. There is no Jewish rabbi called Rabbi Esau. <laughs> once the Muslim, once the Muslims, the, 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 the Muslims, the, uh, the Arabs, once the Arabs come to the Mediterranean and uh, come to rule and oppress the, the Jews, the attitude changed to the hostile one. Um, and Ishmael, again, for, for Sardi Jews, for Sardi Jews, Ishmael does become a technological enemy, which they like to see removed together with uh, uh, Edom and the Christians. And here you can see the quotation from Bahia'i and Asher, which claims, these are the two nations among whom we are oppressed, Edom and Ishmael, and both of them God shall eventually get rid of. But the bottom line is the relationship is that Israel is not the equivalent of Jacob and Esau. Esau is associated with the major traumas of Jewish history. Ishmael is not, which is the reverse of what we see today. And being told that I'm actually running out of time, so I will skip over the early modern period where we see the better Jewish Christian relations and the typology being silenced in, in Jewish renderings of the, of the Bible. I will even skip the period of emancipation and of modernity 
when the Jews become, Jews and Christians become citizens in the same state, and the Jews have to decide what is the relationship between Jacob and Esau. There are some models here for Jewish-Christian relations, which I will not speak about among Reform Jews and among Orthodox Jews. I'm afraid I'll have to skip those. It all did not end very, very well, right? We have the, re the emergence of racial anti-Semitism at the end of the 19th century. Jacob is declared Jewish even for non-Jews. You hate the Jews. No, we, are, we no longer need to be true Israel. In response to it, you have a Zionist Jacob, which equally blames the traditional Jewish um, Jacob. And we end up, when we end up with the emergence of National Socialism and the Holocaust, there is again in which discuss the association between Amalek and Islam. Post-Holocaust period is very different. And the major break with Jewish history, which makes this conference today possible. First, the new, the new phenomenon of Jewish power, Especially in post-1967 Israel, you see a transformation of uh, the view of Esau. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict focuses hostility on Ishmael, whereas Vatican II and the Jewish-Christian dialogue create a new reality in the relationship between Jacob and Esau. And it's so revolutionary that sometimes Orthodox rabbis do not realize what it is that they say, Ben Elal in Jerusalem, declared us that in the new period we may consider an alliance of Jacob and Esau <laughs> against Ishmael. Okay. Uh, this is a major break with Jewish history. Jonathan Sachs does just this right in his limited sermon that speaks, the chief rabbi of Great Britain, in which he speaks about Jacob's struggles with the emperor as a spiritual struggle which created Jacob's lack of surety about his identity, created a tragedy, and he is made responsible for the bad relationship and for the exclusion of his son. And no, no one else other than the Emma Cohen, a leader of, his, of a spiritual leader of settlers in the West, that speaks about Esau following second, second uh, civic tradition as the loss of a brother. Esau is a prospective righteous Jew. In today's United States, Jacob is the most popular first name. Um, in Germany, Jacob the liar is presented in, 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 in novels as someone in a figure in the Lord ghetto attempting to make life better for the Jews. So, where does this leave us? One thing, we are in a new era. For how long? How long is it before the traditional parameters of Jewish Christian relations will be a I don't know. I don't know how much time you have for the dialogue. <laughs> okay. um, but clearly, that collapse of the typology opens a new opportunity for the, uh, the, uh, uh, this, for the Christian Jewish dialogue, the Christian Jewish dialogue, and possibilities for rethinking also Jewish Muslim dialogue. And I will give you all the development of that dialogue and discussion later today. Thank you. Um, it's remarkable how little clear mention of Christianity there is in early rabbinic sources, yes. which clearly are edited in a time when Christianity is known. Um, in later midrash, which I'm trying to avoid that term now, I like post-classical midrash. Um, no, this means eighth. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, the classical period up to the time of 500 CE, uh, and then on post-classical. I mean, Tanhuma continues to be edited uh, until the Middle Ages. Um, so thank you. That's that's important. Yeah. Um, works like um, Agadat Bereshit, which seems to be in the orbit of the Tanhuma literature, maybe eighth, ninth century edited. You have clear polemic against Christianity. It's been written about, there's an article by Levi Teugels about that. And it's very, I don't know, I don't have an explanation for that. I don't know why. Um, it, is this unique? It, it is, in my opinion, very unique. I'll tell you how unique it is. At a conference one time on typology in Jerusalem, where Christian and Jewish scholars got together and talked about typology, which you now know what I'm talking about, 
Um, um, I, I was in the audience, and in the Christian answer period like this, I got up and I said, well, you know, some of us, it's in Jerusalem, so some of you know this midrash about, that I just showed you. And the, the one Jewish panelist who was representing rabbinic literature just said to me, don't mention that. That's how unique it is. This is a real embarrassment to a lot of people. So, well, the Breshit Rabbah is a collection of, of, of material. It's, some of it is named, but it, it's, a, it's a collection. I mean, it, it would be normal to say it, this, this tradition dates from the fourth or fifth century, but I don't think that's right. I think it, who knows how early it is. You could say that it, well, there were a lot of people cruci crucified, you know, and, and this was just that, but that's, a, that's an easy out. I think in the Byzantine period, you can't imagine a Jew talking about Isaac carrying his cross without some reflection of Christianity. I hope that. It's, it's Palestinian rather than Palestinian. It's Palestinian, yes, absolutely. So I'm going to ask for just uh, two more questions. Let's have one addressed to Dr. Cohen and one addressed to Dr. Haskell. I was just going to ask if the questioners could please speak up. It was difficult to understand the question back here. Dr. Taylor. Okay, I'll speak up. Uh, <laughs> really, question and quick comment to Ellen or Mark or First of all, the question, the word for cross in Genesis Rabbah is what? Sumo. Okay, interesting. Is his cross. And the comment you're welcome to respond to is that within Jewish circles, particularly Jewish mystical circles, there can be very different views of Jesus. Uh, the Ari, for example, is recorded by Kanabutal as praying at the grave and spot of Yeshua on the street which shows that there's obviously a different evaluation of uh, the memory of Jesus, maybe in a kind of a mystical way, that his soul's been redeemed or mm -hmm. something like that. Sure. This is, this, I mean, how often do you get a later for me, but the Zohar is very interested in mm -hmm. Jesus, even in the 13th century. Um, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who's the main rabbi of the Zohar, is configured as a sort of celibate resembles Jesus. There are lots of different things that they do with Jesus um, in Jewish mysticism. And it, you can see the ambivalence where there are things about Christianity that are very attractive to them and things that they find extremely 